Voy a ser muy breve, solo quiero saludarlos en nombre del Instituto Cervantes, en nombre del Observatorio de Lengua Española y las Culturas Hispánicas en los Estados Unidos. Un año más eh, ofrecemos una serie de actividades destinadas a la formación de profesores y muy especialmente a la formación de profesores de español como lengua de herencia. Y un año más tenemos el gusto de, de ofrecer estas actividades en colaboración estrecha con el Departamento de Romance Languages de Harvard, pero muy especialmente con la profesora eh, María Luisa Parra, que es la especialista en ese campo y con la que organizamos todas estas eh, actividades, co-organizamos realmente todas estas eh, actividades. Así es que mucho gusto en poder colaborar un año más. Muchas gracias por venir eh, a este curso, en la mayoría o algunos un año más. Y simplemente quería, por un lado, decirles que este año tenemos una nueva becaria de la Fundación Rafael del Pino, que es María Laín, que está aquí con nosotros, así es que si necesitan algo pueden recurrir a ella también. Quería decirles que como en otros cursos de formación de profesores, vamos a entregar al final, por un lado, una encuesta sobre el curso, sobre el desarrollo del curso y sobre el profesor. Y por otro lado, entregaremos también un certificado en el que no hay que hacer nada más que poner cada uno de ustedes el nombre para que pueda, pueda surtir efecto. En él aparecen también las horas, aparece el curso y aparece el profesor, como otras veces también. Así es que sin más, yo, eh, lo voy a dejar con María Luisa Parra, que será la que haga la introducción de nuestro invitado. Muchas gracias y bienvenidos al, al observatorio. Ah, no se me ha oído, muy bien. De nuevo. ¿no? De nuevo ¿no? Bueno, buenos días eh, y gracias por estar acá en sábado en la mañana, después de las dos primeras semanas de semestre, que siempre son eh, un poco complicadas, pero bueno, gracias. Y gracias también al Instituto Cervantes, al Observatorio, al profe Francisco Moreno Fernández por el apoyo a todas estas actividades. Y como mencionó él, hoy tenemos el gusto de tener como invitado al profesor Julio Torres. Él es um, Assistant Professor de Español y Portugués en la Escuela de Humanidades eh, de UC Irvine y tiene su doctorado de Georgetown University en Spanish Linguistics. Eh, él conoce, nos conocimos en alguno de los <risa> múltiples congresos y conferencias y es una persona sumamente dinámica y con una serie de intereses que se conjuntan de manera muy particular. Eh, ahora su investigación se está centrando en la enseñanza del español como lengua de herencia y segundas lenguas, pero se interesa mucho por el bilingüismo, la cognición y su área de especialidad es este enfoque por tareas, desarrollo de currículum e instrucción. Eh, él está en el departamento de español y portugués, como mencioné, eh, y su título es Assistant Professor de eh, Lingüística Aplicada y Multilingüismo. También es el director del programa de español y de lo que le llaman minor, ¿verdad? O subespecialización de educación bilingüe en español e inglés. Eh, y también mm, dirige el laboratorio Rieto, que ya nos comentarás eh, qué tipo de trabajo hace. También trabaja mucho con profesores desde kinder hasta preparatoria, high school, ayudándoles a implementar eh, un currículum, prácticas pedagógicas efectivas. Está afiliado con el National Heritage Language Resource Center de California y es un gran colaborador de varios journals. Muchas gracias por haber venido. Eh, muchas gracias a todos eh, por venir aquí sábado por la mañana, ¿no? sé que no es fácil. <ríe> eh, bien, y pues estoy muy contento y es un honor eh, estar aquí. Siempre es una experiencia tan gratificante ¿no? eh, cuando tienes la oportunidad de compartir tu trabajo con otras personas. Eh, so, I'm going to switch to English um, just because um, I think due to the presentation and Maria Luisa asked me to do it in English so, so that the video can have más alcance, um, but as you notice, I'll probably be code switching, right? Um, but feel free to ask questions in Spanish, to make comments in Spanish, um, that's um, totally fine. 
Um, and in fact, this material, I sort of think about it more in English because I, I talk about it more in English. So, um, but anyway, se puede haber code switcheo, aquí no pasa nada, ¿no? Eh, así que, pero solamente para decirles que me mantienen mayormente en inglés por esa razón, ¿bien? Ok. Um, so, I, I sort of want to start out, um, so the, the title of the workshop is Task in Action, right? Exploring Task-Based Language instructor, Instruction with Heritage Learners. Um, so the first thing I want to look at is, I want you to give me your reaction of this comic strip. Like, what does it tell you? Let me give you a second so that you can talk. I'm going to try not to talk as much. Uh, okay, so if you want to speak with the person next to you, um, sort of what do you get? What's your reaction when you see that um, comic strip? <laughs> Okay, so what thoughts came to mind? <clears throat> Ideas. Yes. Para you can say in Spanish, yeah, that, no problem. Yeah. Eh, para nosotros, eh, hemos visto que es el concebir la tarea como algo negativo. Okay. Como un amigo de Dios. Sí, como una, el, el, la manera en la que se concibe ¿no? una tarea. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the way we perceive, the way the task is being perceived, it sort of has a negative, perhaps, um, there's a negative tone to it, perhaps? Okay, yeah. Okay. Like a traditional task. Like a traditional task, like cleaning the floor, right? Mark the floor, uh-huh. Yeah, we said from both sides, it looks like it might be something extra for the students that they're not used to doing. They're okay. They're used to doing grammar exercises, but then we also said it as a practical aspect because Practical. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, so there's a practical <laughs> aspect, right? They're cleaning, right? They're, okay, what else? Yes? We were thinking, what is the meaning of the task? Uh-huh. That's what we see, we said, maybe about. Okay, okay, so what is the meaning of a task? That's okay, okay. Parece que la profesora ha Okay. So okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you the secret, right? How you work less and students work more, right? <laughs> I like that. Okay. So we don't see a teacher here. That's interesting, right? We only see students. Okay. So students are working more. Okay. And the teacher is nowhere. Um, maybe having a drink, um, cafecito, yeah, okay, anything else? Good, okay, so it's, anyone else? So these ideas are interesting, right? Um, what we think of when we see this image, the one thing I do want to say is that the important for me for this image is they're doing something, right? So they're not listening to a lecture, they're not, they're actually doing, okay? So what I sort of want to introduce tasks is students are doing, right? Um, and it sort of goes with the philosophy that students should be doing things with the language, okay? Um, I often tell um, my um, instructors, right, that if I observe them and they're doing most of the talking, that's a red flag, right? Because the students should be doing most of the work in the classroom, okay? All right. So before I begin the presentation, I just want to acknowledge my amazing collaborators. So some of the work that I'll be sharing um, today um, is work that's been a collaborative effort. So I want to acknowledge Dr. Ellen Serafini, who's a professor at George Mason University, and Dr. Melissa Barot, who's a professor at Florida International University, and a soon-to-be professor or doctor, um, Dr. Um, Bianca Khan, who is a graduate student, um, a PhD student in the School of Education at UC Irvine. So um, I wanted to acknowledge that some of the work I'll be talking about has been a collaborative um, effort with them. Okay, so I want to sort of divide and give us what's our agenda for today. So the first part of the talk is going to be very brief, okay, because you didn't come here to talk about research, right? You came here to see how do we do TBLT, task-based language teaching, in the classroom. However, I do want to offer um, some data, um, especially data that I've been working with with heritage learners. Um, so the first part is going to be on research aspects, on task-based language um, learning or teaching. Um, and then the second part of the workshop, which will be the longest part of the workshop, will be how do we do task-based language teaching in the classroom, okay? Um, so that's how we, that's our plan for today. Okay, is everyone okay? Yeah. Okay, and everyone should have handouts. Uh, that will be for the second part, for the workshop part. Okay. 
Okay, so everyone has handouts. I just want to make sure that, okay, we're good. All right, so the first thing I want to do now is we're going to watch a short video, okay? And after we watch the video, we are going to discuss the video. Um, some of you might have seen this video, and it was going viral in social media. Um, these are the people from the group Pero Like. I don't know, have you seen those videos? They're hilarious, they're great. Um, so this is a Pero Like video. Um, so I'm going to play this and then we'll talk. Where's my... There you are. Ha ha, what a funny cold open. One thing that my co-workers pride themselves on is their bilingualness. <laughs> Wait, is that a word? As for me, I'm only partially bilingual and struggle with the language quite a bit. I'm going to take out all my frustrations and give them a Spanish pop quiz. <laughs> I had a Spanish instructor create a test based on some things I heard around the office. I am confident in the sense that I grew up with it. Uh, I only speak Spanish at home. Having said that, I suck at accents and I suck at taking tests about Spanish. I'm mad confident in my Spanish. I was born speaking Spanish and this is my second language. Writing it, of course I text in Spanish all the time. Of course I know how to write in Spanish. <laughs> okay, I haven't written it in Spanish. <laughs> the official language of Curly is neither English or Spanish, it's Spanglish. I'm not the best in Spanish and I'm not the best at English, but I'm super good at Spanglish. I don't know how I'm going to do on this test. I keep thinking I speak well, but I'm also like, the Dominican in me is like, oh girl, you about to fail. I think that the only problem that I have is like my accents on things and like putting the enye on it, I'm like, all the accent marks in the following passage have been omitted. Write them in. No, that's what I have Siri and Espanol for. Accent marks? Álvaro, hijo. ¿Por qué no querías ir con tu papá a Bogotá? ¿Hijo? ¿Y? I'm going to put one there. Who knows? Papá. Is there an accent there? A Bogotá. Is there an accent there? A mi kid? No. Why not? Do you think you should have one? Dang, I don't know. I don't understand. Can I skip? Por qué no querías? Is it an accent, okay? This is some bullshit. <laughs> Maya, I hate you. Put it in. <coughs> no? It sounds like a piece. I got none right. This is zero. There's an accent on que and por qué. As soon as you said it, I knew where it was. No, on him? No. <gasps> I don't know. Because since when we put accent on names, people? This is simple, but it's not this one. No es que no me gustas. Is that right? No es que no me gustas. I was, I was saying no me caes bien. Tú no me disgustas, pero no te quiero tampoco. That was, that was messed up. I was totally fucking overthinking that one. There's gusta is the exact translation of dislike. Either way, I got this shit right. You know what I mean, son? I don't like politics with politics like me. I mean, no me cae bien los politics. No me gustan los políticos, pero los políticos me gustan a mí. Yo no quiero la política, pero la política me quiere a mí. But I would never even say the sentence anyway, because you would never hear that sentence going right yeah. outside of your minute. You know, when I was writing it, I was thinking about that, because when you say that, me gustan a mi, it's still saying you're liking it. Okay. All right, he got me there. But you can all say quiero for life, but in this formal setting, you guys me gusta. I think I learned that I need to pay more attention to the way that people speak and how they use their tenses because I think I just get a little lazy with it, but I'm like, they know what I meant. Take that space. You ain't got shit on me. You never stop learning in this life. And this is a huge lesson. Mommy, I'm so happy and I know you will be proud of me. <laughs> okay. 
Good. All right, so by the way, I forgot to give a warning that there were a couple curse words, so I hope no one got <laughs> offended at that. Okay, so real quickly, what I want you to do with the people around you and at your table is discuss your reaction to the video, okay? And what happened, okay? <laughs> Okay, did everyone have some time to talk, to share? Okay, what are some of the ideas you talked about in your groups as far as reactions to the video? Uh -huh. Well, I said it wasn't surprising to me because I'm a heritage speaker of Russian. Okay. I grew up from, I, we came here when I was one. Uh huh. And I only took one course in undergrad okay. to improve. Mm -hmm. but, uh, there were a few of us in there. Some of them mm -hmm. came when they were older, but we would argue with the professor about things. Okay. <laughs> and I get out of the class and I call my mom, like, Mom, how is it? Is it this or this? And she says, Oh, it's that. I'm like, Why didn't you ever correct me? She's like, Because there's only one logical way to understand it, and it wasn't a big deal. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so those kind of things happen all the time. Mm -hmm. that you're, you're comprehensible, you're mm -hmm. intelligible, and mm -hmm. so no one really corrects, not mm -hmm. corrects you, no one tells you how the standard mm -hmm. is. Okay. So, okay. Completely normal, yeah. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Normal? Yes. When you are a heritage speaker and you're in a mixed class, often you're between two very difficult spots. On the one hand, uh, you, could, you may have a native speaker in the class with you if you're a heritage learner, and you might do something that they you know, know is not correct, and so then you might get a rebuke like, oh, well, then. You're just not Dominican enough, Colombian enough, Spanish, or whatever. And then on the other hand, you might see that a friend of yours that is not a native speaker mm -hmm. has gotten a better grade on the grammar mm -hmm. test than you. And mm -hmm. so then there's, there's like a letdown. And mm -hmm. so there's... That effective component yes, to exactly. it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. What else? Anyone else? Yes. Well, we were talking about, we don't know if it is a pair-like condition to record these videos, but all of them are saying, uh, I speak Spanish really well, but mm -hmm. they are all speaking in English. Mm -hmm. so. uh -huh. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, also, we were talking about the, the exercise with the accents. Mm -hmm. They don't know where to put the accent, but when they read, they read. They were reading it perfect. with the accent in its place. Yeah, so that's they, right. They can read mm -hmm. perfectly. Yes, so it's yes. Again about Very good. Like that's a good observation. Learning the, the grammar. Mm -hmm. no, it's not about producing, mm -hmm. so obviously they can do it. Good, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I automatically with the accent went right back to AP Spanish in high school where uh -huh. one of my really good friends, her one of her parents is Cuban, one is American. Mm -hmm. She said, Of course you'll get a better score than me. I have no clue what the accent. Like <laughs> yeah, <She> exactly. said, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. No, de no okay, so there shouldn't be any tests. Yeah. And well, not only any test. No, no calificación. Evaluación, okay. sí. Oh, okay. No calificación. Okay, okay. So no grades to yes, the test. Exactly. Okay, okay. Interesting. And, and that's so you hit to something important, the test. <coughs> what was the test measuring, right? Um, to me, that was a horrible design of a test for our heritage learners. They were putting them at a disadvantage right away, okay? Um, even some of the phrases that they had to translate, right? Were, were kind of, you know, one of the best comments um, that I enjoyed from the video was, I would not even say that, right? Which reflects what? When that, when that one of the um, cast members from um, the cast um, said, I wouldn't even say that. Because did the test reflect their usage of Spanish? Daily usage of Spanish. It's decontextualized. It's good, exactly. That's what I want to get to. It's decontextualized. Right from the way heritage learners usually use their Spanish. Okay, so I'm not advocating that we don't teach accents. I'm not advocating right, um, but the assessment was poorly designed. Right, decontextualized, um, did not reflect how they use language in the real world in their communities. When we think about them functioning in their bilingual communities, right? So these are all problematic areas. My other side, you want to? Yeah, no, I think that that phrase with the politics, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say either. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not just a matter of heritage, mm -hmm. how they use the language, but I don't mm -hmm. think it makes any sense to any of us. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that the, the problem with the test, it was this con the contextualized, mm -hmm. and it was trying to test on grammar mm -hmm. and structures without meaning. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and 
that we don't operate like yeah. that. <laughs> That's right. Yes, and we hope we don't operate like that, right? Um, in the world. So, yes. No, no, no. Go ahead, please. I just have a question. Is translation a normal tool with heritage students? No, that's, that's an interesting um, idea, translation, because I actually I was in, um, last year when we were in Urbana Champagne, um, I was having a conversation about translation, right? Because translation mm -hmm. is given a bad rap, I think, in language teaching. Um, some people are trying to bring it back, but I think, so one of the things I tell people is that heritage learners are used to translating a lot of them, right, and interpreting for family members um, and so forth, right? We call that, I think, linguistic brokering, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, there are studies that have shown that a lot of heritage speakers take Spanish in order to do that function, right? To be able to translate out and, or interpret for family members. Um, so I don't think we should dismiss it completely. However, it shouldn't be done this way, the way it's being done, right? So there needs to be, again, some context, right, um, of why they're doing it, for what purpose, right? This was completely decontextualized um, and so forth. So yeah, so I, I think we need to revisit translation. Um, and in fact, the volume that we are co-editing, someone is contributing a chapter on translation how to use translation techniques with heritage learners, right? So we have to sort of, I think, look at it um, from a different way, okay? Yeah, thank you for that comment. Um, okay, so I sort of want to bring this as a motivation of why I believe that task-based language teaching is a viable tool to teach heritage language learners, okay? Um, <clears throat> so here are where I want to introduce, and I'm going to be referring to it as TBLT, right? It sounds like a sandwich every time we think about it, right? <laughs> um, but that's sort of, all right, the acronym that we use for um, talking about task-based language teaching. Um, so I sort of want to highlight you all. By the way, the PowerPoint will be available on the website, um, okay? So in case, if you're neurotic like me, I always have to take notes regardless, but if you don't want to take notes, you have to let you know that the PowerPoint will be available. Okay, so um, TBLT is an educational framework, okay? Um, and this is, by the way, based from the website. There's a TBLT organization website with a lot of resources. I'm gonna give you, at the end of the presentation, another website um, where you can look for more resources if you'd like. Um, and what's really important is that task-based language teaching adopts a meaning-based, communicative task, okay? Um, as the central unit for doing instruction, assessment, and curriculum design. Now, real quickly, right, when we think about communication, when I teach um, foreign language teaching methodology to my graduate students, I often ask them first, what is communication? And we have a discussion of what does communication even mean, right? So, because I'm trying to go a little faster because I want to get to the right, um, second part of the workshop, right, I always tell them communication is exchanging new information. Okay? So for example, when I was a high school teacher, I would ask my Spanish one students, and if you do this, don't worry, but I would say, ¿Qué tiempo hace hoy? You know, what is the weather like today? Clase, ¿qué hora es? What time is it? That's not communicative because everyone can see that the time is 10.30, right? So I'm not exchanging. The fact that I'm saying it's cloudy, um, it's not new information, right? So that's not communication because everyone can see that. Duh, Senor Torres, es, right? Es nublado, right? Or está nublado, right? Um, so, so when I talk about communication, it's this idea of exchanging new information, okay? And again, there might be another pedagogical reason for us to say what time it is or what's the weather like, right? But um, it's not communication. Okay, so that's important. Um, so. Here I'm going to say why I think task-based language teaching is a viable tool, right, or pedagogical model for heritage language learners. Um, and I often tell people that it's like my religion, right? So my, my graduate students at our university, right, they're all literature scholars and they already talk about task-based language teaching, right, um, um, as if they were even applied linguists, okay, in many cases. Um, so the first thing is that TBLT is learner-centered, so it's behind the philosophy. That's why we saw in the comic that there, were, there was no teacher involved, right? It was the learners, right? So this is about the learners, okay? And it's learner-centered. And again, this comes from educational philosophy that um, the teacher should play a different role, not um, the, the, it shouldn't be a passive role where the students are just sitting there and getting information. That seems to not be the best way of learning, but we're seeing that not only in language, but also in math, in different areas, right? That is the interaction, it's doing, creating with the material, analyzing material, right? It's what engages learners, okay? So that's very important to understand. Um, second is that TBLT is also values, right? Um, or endorses that 
tasks have to be relevant and valuable to learners' education, to learners' um, learning. For example, the assessment that we saw in the video, right? We said it was decontextualized. They're like, we wouldn't even use that. Um, you know, we get, we tend to get obsessed with accents. I've been traveling to Mexico for the fa fa past five years, and I've been taking a lot of pictures of signs where there are no accents so that when I work with people, I can tell them, look, in Mexico tampoco, right? <laughs> so, right, so we tend to get obsessed about those things, right? And if, as you saw in the video, they don't use the language to really put accent marks and so forth, right? So we need to ask ourselves, what I like about TBLT is what is it, re what's relevant to their learning? What is it that they find valuable, okay? So that's very important. Um, also, task-based language teaching, it does not come from nowhere. Right, is grounded on psycholinguistic processes of second language acquisition. Okay, so we have a lot of literature in the field of SLA um, that has um, examined the development of interlanguage. Okay, so many, how many of you have heard the term interlanguage, right? So it's the linguistic system that L2 learners develop, right? They're not speaking Spanish or English or speaking something, right? And that something we call interlanguage, okay? Um, so we have a lot of research, um, especially since the 80s, on how learners' um, language develops, okay? Um, and we know, yes, because you teach double object pronouns today, doesn't mean it's gonna be part of their interlanguage tomorrow, okay? So again, TAS looks at also and recognizes, acknowledges um, that there are psycholinguistic process, um, psycholinguistic constraints, right, um, to learning as well. Um, and also, I love TBLT because it's empirically based, okay? So one of the awesome things is that for TBLT started officially, we can say 1985, okay? So we have years and years of research, okay, and data, right, that we can look at on how <coughs> TAS promotes second language learning, okay? Notice I'm saying second language learning, and I'm not saying heritage language learning because we still know very little, right, um, about the effects of TAS on heritage language learners. But there is an improvement base. And I often, when I work with teachers, I always tell them when people are promoting pedagogy and they're not showing you outcomes or evidence, hashtag suspect, okay? So um, I work with teachers during the summer in, in Guanajuato, Mexico, and they um, have used, they endorse the hashtag, right? Oh, hashtag suspect, right? So because as teachers, we, even though we're not researchers, we need to be very critical of the information we're getting. And it's Astonishing to me, sometimes I see videos, sometimes I see things, I'm like, oh no, that's wrong, or that's not empirically accurate, right? So one of the things I like about TBLT is that it offers empirical evidence, right? Um, we're seeing outcomes. Um, and finally, um, as my mom used to say, con que se come eso, right? <laughs> right? Um, so um, what is the practical implementation, right, um, of TBLT is that there is a methodology to implement it in the classroom, right? So yes, it's beautiful that we can theorize, right, those of us who get nerdy about language acquisition, right, that we come up with theories, we test theories and so forth, but at the end of the day, how does that affect the classroom, right? Um, and as teachers, right, um, um, I, we, we are interested in that component as well. Okay. So this is kind of my rationale, why task-based, and again, so I want to be very clear also, I'm not saying that task-based language teaching is a panacea, y es la varita magica, right, that it's gonna cure all the diseases, right, and so forth, but I think it's a very viable, right, um, pedagogical approach. Obviously, there are others out there. Um, so I want to sort of kind of just take you um, through kind of what a task-based language teaching program will look, would look like. Um, so there are some components here that I summarized. The first is the needs analysis. So a needs analysis is basically a method, and I'm going to show you some data on this. Um, it's basically a method to kind of identify what tasks, okay, we are going to design or use in our courses, okay? So the idea is what are the communicated needs of our learners, okay? And that comes through a needs analysis, okay? Then we get to the pedagogic task, which we're gonna be talking about today, okay? Um, the pedagogic task is basically the curriculum, the, the pedagogical materials, okay? Um, then exit task is how we evaluate that the learners actually have met the communicated goals of those tasks. And finally, we also have to evaluate the program. How relevant was the program for the students? How effective were the pedagogical materials? Now, I want to say something. So we talk about task-based language teaching. We also talk about task-supported. So this is what a hardcore 
TBLT program will look like. However, other people have different variations of it. Um, where, you, so for example, in our language program, um, we have what I call a ta we call in the field a task supported program, right? Because task is not the only thing that's going on, but it is a main component of our program. So as teachers, as program directors, we can adapt these as we see fit in our curriculum. Okay, everyone's with me? Yeah. Okay, great. So now I want to go to my, I'm going to put on my scientific, scientist hat on, right? Research hat on, okay? And talk a little bit of some data, okay, on task-based instruction with heritage learners. Okay, so I'm going to cover three areas here. We, I'm going to talk about a needs analysis that my colleague and I did um, to teach a business Spanish course. Uh, I'm going to talk about interaction. Most of the research that has been done with task-based instruction has been more in the area of interaction, examining what happens when heritage and second language learners interact to do a task. Okay? And finally, also, there's been an interest on learner perception. What do learners perceive these collaborations to be like? Okay? So I want to talk about these three areas, um, and especially with a couple study, uh, one particular study, um, that we conducted um, the last couple years, I think now. I forget when I do stuff now. Um, okay, so let's talk about needs analysis first, okay? Remember that needs analysis is the first component of a TBLT program. So here, we a needs analysis is the method, okay, to identify communicative tasks using input from multiple sources of information using multiple methods, okay? So um, people who work in needs analysis have asked, okay, what is the best way, how do we use the best methods to make sure that the tasks, right, that we identify for our students in our program are in fact relevant, right, are reliable and credible tasks. So for this, um, this um, needs analysis paper, my colleague and I at George Mason University were both commissioned to teach a business Spanish course. I've never taught business Spanish, I've never taken a business class in my life. I was like, ¿Cómo hacemos esto? Okay? Um, so, and she and I, we were having, um, we are calling each other twins for that semester because we were teaching ex exact, the exact same courses um, um, at the time. So what we decided to do, okay, we don't know anything about business, Spanish necessarily, right? There's a textbook, obviously. But we know how to do task-based language teaching, right? So why don't we put it to use, okay? So what we did is we decided to create the curriculum completely based on tasks. So what we did was conduct first the needs analysis. We're like, okay, what do we teach? What is relevant, right, in a business Spanish course? So what we did is the first phase, there are two phases of the needs analysis. The first phase we did is we asked people, business professionals, to suggest to us what are tasks that you do in your daily work life, okay? So what is it that you do, okay? Um, and they gave us a to and we kind of um, had them classify these tasks by reading, writing, speaking, and listening, okay? Because obviously these are skills that we are promoting in the classroom. So they gave us 40 tasks, a list of 40 tasks, right? Um, and this is the method, it was open-ended. We just wanted them to brainstorm for us, right? And jot down these tasks. So this is what we did. We took those 40 tasks they identified, and we took that to phase two. This is what we did in phase two. In phase two, we took those tasks and we gave them to business majors and minors at our university. And we asked them the following, out of these 40 tasks, which of these you would rate that you do frequently? And which are these are, and what, how difficult are these tasks to do? Okay, so these were business majors and minors, right? And they gave us these, the data, right, on this. So what we came, and again, I'm, feel free to ask questions. I, I did this yesterday, right? I go through things quickly. You can always ask questions for me to elaborate on things, right? Um, so this is what, I'm going to give you an example of the type of task, right, that came up during our needs analysis for interpretive listening. We're all familiar with Axel's, right? Um, five C's, okay? So, um, so for example, listen to guest speakers give presentation, listen to news about current affairs. Again, remember, these are the tasks that our business experts gave us. We asked our business majors and minors to write these tasks of how frequent they do it and how difficult these tasks are for them, okay? So we had interpretive listening, we had writing, we had reading, okay? So we were kind of classifying. So what we did is, after we analyzed this, and by the way, this is all in the paper, um, if you really want to read it and try to do something similar, right, we outlined the whole methodology in this paper. Um, so we came up with five tasks 
okay, what we call exit tasks for the course, okay? Based on all that information, I'm not gonna bore you with the details, okay? Um, so, for example, one of the tasks was summarize and analyze the following case study regarding Bank of America's financial crisis and collaborate to come up with a solution for the three individual customers affected by the crisis, okay? So this was based on these tasks. What we try to, we're trying to do is kind of group them together and come up with um, key tasks, right? Uh, what we call target task types for the um, class, and here we kind of allied them with actual standards where, right, which actual standards they were um, targeting. Mm -hmm. well, quick question, mm -hmm. the business major, um, majors, the majors uh -huh. were in a Spanish No, majors. they were not. They yeah. were, that's a good question, yeah, they, business majors in the business school. In the business school. Yes, so yes, because our students were Spanish majors, most of them, right? Uh -huh. Although we had some double majors in the right, class, right, okay. right? But we wanted to get the kids from the business, business school to tell us right. what they do, because we wanted the class to reflect, right, what happens in the business school. Okay, all right, so everyone is with me. So we did this, okay? So again, so what we did is, we kind of did this, we taught the course, we both taught the course, okay? And one of the things we wanted to find out before teaching the class is like, okay, we did this. Now, was this even good, right? Um, meaning that how good was, how, did learners find these tasks to be um, relevant and valuable to their learning? So we did all the needs analysis. So what we did is we conducted another study, a classroom-based study, okay? Um, and what we said to, Every time the students completed one of these tasks, there were five of them, we gave them a questionnaire, a motivation questionnaire. Real quickly, 10 questions, okay? Right, they didn't write their names, right? Because we didn't want this to affect their grades and whatsoever, right? And they had to tell us, they had to answer these statements. I persisted with the task, I concentrated on the task, I am satisfied with my performance, I am glad about it, I found the task interesting, I am satisfied, et cetera, right? By the way, feel free to steal this and use it, right, if you want to assess your student's motivation, right? And we call this task-specific motivation. So what we found was the following. Now I'm gonna give you her some data. So we compared her, my, one of our classes, um, we compared our classes, and if you see here, they rated the task basically the same. There were no differences between our classes, okay? So there was no teacher effect, none of that, right? They both rated the task the same way, okay? And basically what we found is that they rated these tasks, remember four, um, four was I quite agree, so that was a high mark, okay? Which indicates that, right, they were um, highly motivated more, right, to do these tasks, right? If you see at, if you look at the numbers, okay? So what we found is there was a little discrepancy with task two, which had the lowest motivation from all of them, right? Again, all of them, if you look at the numbers, they're basically similar, right? But task two had uh, a little lower number, and we explain in the paper why that is, right? Because it was doing the case study, um, and that probably complicated things, especially for our students who were not business majors. Again, but what this kind of demonstrates is the following. And by the way, there were no differences between our second language learners and heritage learners. No differences, okay? So that means all the students in the class found these tasks to be relevant and to be valuable to their learning experience. Okay? Okay? Yes? I have an experimental design question. So on the questionnaire back there, mm -hmm. what would be the rationale for putting, mm -hmm. I'm satisfied with my performance and I'm satisfied? That's two different questions, for instance. Is it just to check that they're being mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and that's why these are negative. I feel angry about my performance. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. exactly. Also, mm -hmm. These are, oh, that's a good question. These learners were um, Spanish majors and minors oh, okay. at the university, yeah. Okay. And we kind of talk about that linking, the fact that they were major and minors, so maybe they already had some motivation already coming into the class, right? Um, so how does that interplay as well, okay? All right, so here we see that this was, I just want to show you that doing a needs analysis can be a useful tool right, to identify relevant tasks for students. Okay, so now let's look at interaction research, okay? We're moving on. Okay, so um, this is research that has looked at task-based peer interaction, okay? And I wanna acknowledge my colleagues who have done, have begun, right, um, documented the, documenting these interactions. So this is basically what we have found. First of all, a lot of these interactions focus on vocabulary, right, that's the main focus. Two, it seems that heritage language learners are providing more assistance, okay, to these learners, especially with vocabulary. Three, 
There is a study, Bowles 2011, she found that L2 learners provided more assistance to the heritage learners with spelling and accent marks, which is not surprising, perhaps, right? Okay. Um, and finally, both when these two studies, Bowles and all 2014 and Henshaw 2015, they found that heritage language learners and L2 learners both perceived that L2 learners benefit more from the interaction. Okay? All right? So this is sort of what data we have thus far. Okay? I want to be clear, these studies were basically done with intermediate students, level students in language courses. Second, this study was done on the computer. There was computer interaction, what we call computer-mediated communication. These studies were done face-to-face, -face. okay? All right, because I want to sort of motivate what the study that we're doing. Some preliminary observations, kind of putting it together, okay? And then I'll welcome feedback, and maybe then we can take a break if we, before starting the second part, okay? Um, so I've, showed you, I've shown you data, okay? that both heritage and L2 learners find tasks to be relevant and meaningful when these are done through a needs analysis, right? So my colleague and I, we did the needs analysis, we did all, you know, tested that, we gave them the post-task questionnaire and they found those tasks to be relevant. This might be a good strategy. Two, we also found that L2 <coughs> learners benefit more from these interactions. And in fact, the reason why you saw that most LREs were initiated and solved in the HL and L2 pair. We digged, we went deeper into the data. Most of those were initiated by L2 learners and solved by the heritage learner. Okay? So when the heritage learner interacts with another heritage learner, they're not worried about all these things that the L2 learner is worried. The other thing is we have data to suggest that the L2 learner sees the heritage learner many times as an expert. Okay? So like, este no tiene que saber todo, <laughs> right? Because this person grew up speaking Spanish, right? Este habla bien, okay? So again, so what we saw is that um, in those um, LREs, L2 learners are more preoccupied with surface linguistic structures, okay? How do you say this word? Is this the right tense, et cetera? However, heritage learners, again, tend to focus more on the meaning-oriented aspect of the task. People who were yesterday, um, we were talking about the studies, again, this is a replication from that other study that they were task-based, I'm finding this again, okay? Um, so if you notice, especially what was interesting the, when they report how their partner helped, they reported, oh, here she gave me ideas, right? Again, they were worried more about the ideas of solving the task, right? Um, than worrying about the accent marks, perhaps, or a use of a particular verb. I think what I'm seeing from these data is that it seems that when heritage learners work with other heritage learners, they're relying more on their existing linguistic resources. Okay? In fact, when we looked at the interaction between heritage and heritage learners, the only times that they were coming up with these LREs was to talk about very technical business language. Other than that, they were not. It seems like it was interesting to see that they were using their communicative abilities, okay, to write the letter without having to worry about every little single thing. What's interesting to me is the second part, right, the results of the accuracy and complexity, right, that nuestros muchachos, with their resources, they're producing more complex tasks, texts, right, and their accuracy does not diminish, right? Um, because of that, keep in mind, these are advanced learners. Keep that in mind, right? So we would need to see this with intermediate learners. The reason we did advanced is because there have been so many studies with intermediate learners. Maria Luisa told us that in a recent publication. You're with Masha, right? And that's why you were also looking at advanced learners, right? Because we have a lot on more in intermediate. We tend to forget about the kids who are more advanced, okay? We assume that they have exactly. a hole that they don't need to be exactly. whatever. We don't need to think about the learning process, but process. they keep learning. They keep Nobody learning. The exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay. All right, so questions now. <coughs> Everything is clear? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yes. I just have two kind of questions. Sure. Addition. You said that they, in the computer versus face-to-face, -face, they had more correction, self-correction, mm -hmm. right? And you said it was kind of unknown as to exactly why. So yes, you because you can see your mistakes. That's right, right? exactly you can't right. You can see your mistakes when you speak. That's right. So the interaction, what we see is that when you do written text, when you're 
um, texting, basically, right? They were on Skype interacting. Um, it keeps that log, right? So you can see it, it becomes more salient, right? So we talked about the word saliency, right? Um, so your mistakes become more salient, um, and you tend to correct them. The other reason that there are not a lot of LREs either in SMC is because what we saw in the interaction is like someone would produce a sentence, oh, we should write this, eh, debemos eh, despedir a. You don't have to negotiate a lot because what they did was copy and boop, paste it on their Word document, right? So because the written text chat um, and the, the task, the modality was the same. Whereas in face-to-face, -face, right, you're talking to write, it requires more interaction, right? And it, it requires more negotiation, right, than um, in the SCMC mode because of that chat log. And again, you can go back. Right? What I wish I would have done was recorded their screens to see how often they went back and, oh, that's another study. Uh, right? Yeah. Because kind of you can see, right, when they went back and how and that, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other consideration, uh, you said that the HLHL had more subordination, right? Yeah, they produce significantly more than the yeah. HLL2. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't feel that strange because they don't follow the same learning mode as L2 learners, right? L2 learners always learn the more basic instructions and then you know, go to more advanced constructions as they go. Like they don't even subordinate until who knows third semester. But these are advanced kids, L two no, learners. But but regardless, I think like you know the hair is learning but the, doing that longer. Yes, I, I, I take your point, but what we're seeing in the L two literature is that that development tends to not be linear necessarily. Well, we're right, because yeah. learning is new mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah. It doesn't tend to be linear. Um, and there were obviously samples of subordination mm -hmm. in the HLL2. Right. Doesn't mean that there weren't. In. I think, this is what I'm working with. By the way, oh, I shouldn't say this, I'm being recorded. But anyway, <laughs> people out there, am, am I, I may be wrong, um, <laughs> right? Because I'm writing the paper right now, okay? And I'm analyzing. So I'm thinking right now, these data, I'm sharing, estamos en familia, but, right? <laughs> even though I'm being recorded. But again, these, this is what I'm thinking about right now. I think that all of those LREs, and since they produce more interactive moves, that might have distracted them of producing more sophisticated text. Mm. That may be, I think, I'm, gonna, I'm still thinking about this, um, again, because your attention is limited. Your working memory is limited, right? So if you are constantly interrupting to talk about, is, does this have an accent, does this, right? That might be distracting you from being able to produce a more, a longer text, a more sophisticated text. That's my hypothesis right now, and that's what I'm working with, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that maybe as they, when you have second language um, learners mm -hmm. that are not third year students, like mm -hmm. the textbooks and everything take the subordination usually to the end of everything. And as if it was the most difficult task that you could ever do in study. So I think that they may have this like in their minds. Mm -hmm. like heritage learners maybe mm -hmm. hear that at home mm -hmm. and don't think that that's subordinated. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, I like that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, sort of the perception of what producing these types of texts or long sentences, how difficult is it is. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Can you explain um, a little more or give details about L2 learners benefiting more from HL L2? Yes. Yes. So remember when I talked about aspects. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what we see here, uh, let me go back, let me go back, let me go back, let me go back. Okay, so we see it here, especially in the LREs, okay? So remember I said that the LREs are these language-related episodes that one of the learners brings up some type of metalinguistic language-related issue, right? Uh, what we're seeing is that, and not only in this study, this replicates my colleagues, other colleagues' studies, is that L2 learners tend to initiate these a lot more. Okay, because they're worried more about these surface linguistic features. Okay, does this have an accent? How do you use this word? What tense is this? Da, 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 da. Right? But what we see is that most who solves them, sometimes the same L2 learner solves the LRE, that happens. Okay, but most of the times, and we saw that in our data, that the heritage learner is solving those more often. So, therefore, what is going on here is that the learning opportunities are increasing for the L2 learner. Right? Because he or she is benefiting from his or her knowledge of the language. So the, the other two learner, in, in a sense, is more aware, right? Becomes more aware of, and more yes. conscious. 
Yes, they're more aware about language, right? And yesterday we talked about prior language experience, right? Because L2 learners, right, think about their learning trajectory, right? They come into a class, right? Y los bombardeamos with grammar rules, right? And all that, right? So they are more sensitive and they're more, at, you know, and it's not only in this study, this is done um, there have been these really cool, I've been reading collaborative studies between L2 and L2 learners, right, in their writing, in terms of planning. And even when L2 works with another L2, they're not too worried about the planning stage, they're more worried about the translating. So they're more worried about language feature, but I think it is the nature of their learning experience in the classroom, right, that we are, they tend to be given so many rules, so they're more preoccupied with that. Whereas our heritage learners, they're not at home growing up Right? We're not, right? Okay. Um, right? We're not, the heritage learners are not in, exposed unless part of they have a tyrant linguist <laughs> parent, right? Um, right? The heritage learners are used to using the language, right, to communicate. But that's the other thing that because of the task, if you notice my task was a communicative task. They had to solve something, right? So for them, what's more important is solving the task. Right? Um, not necessarily the language is not that crucial. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter at all, right? As we saw here, um, well, here we saw, again, so they do come up with it. See here, these were two heritage learners interacting. By the way, these are heritage learners that were, that took our writing courses at UC or right? I'm so proud, right? <laughs> because I'm like, oh, they're coming, they're coming up with these with accents, so they're thinking about them. So hope for us, right? okay? <laughs> for those of you, keep on doing what you're doing, right? So that's I, I kind of was happy because of these were kids. These were some of these were my first students in our heritage language writing course who participated in this study. So I was kind of pleased that they're coming up with LREs in between them about accent, and one of them solved it. Okay, so this is so they are learning. Okay, so, but again, their motivation, their drive to do these tasks is not based necessarily on this, right? It's more on the planning of those ideas. Okay, anyone else? Excuse me, but how did you, did you record interaction? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you put them in the classroom and... No, so they came to a lab. Ah, they yeah. came to a lab. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. People, have inter people have done that in a classroom. For me, it would be hard because of... Noise and, and again, these were not, they were not taking my class, so I tend to not collect data when I'm teaching because I don't want it to be a conflict. Um, so this, this was a colleague. They were enrolled in a grammar and composition course. Um, I, no, they were not in an advanced the grammar course. With their peers, the same peers, yes, yes, yes. So the peers were the same, exactly. And we matched them based on their scores on the DELE proficiency test we gave them, yeah. So whoever. So the heritage also took the DELE. That's right, yeah. Okay. So the highest score on the DELE, whoever, for example, so if the two, the heritage and the L2 learner who had the highest score, they were matched, mm -hmm. right? Um, to kind of control a little bit proficiency. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. But all of them were in the same classroom working together, yeah, already. Mm -hmm. So that took out, so there, there was some familiarity with, right, their peer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are we teaching grammar in class? Today? Um, I, I hope so. Um, I think I, so. I going over grammar rules. Yes. I, well, I don't know. I don't know. I cannot speak with it for everyone, but I think in our program, yeah. The only difference is we're trying to make it more contextualized. Exactly. That's right. So that's, yeah. That's why. I asked so we do. Gra so today in the afternoon, we're gonna. You don't teach grammar rules. Um, no, you yeah, can if it's so necessary. So. Yes. Or we do a flipped approach, so our students um, get the rules at home. Um, yeah. And then they come and yeah, yeah. So we don't dismiss that, but and today we're going to see with task based instruction how that fits in, right? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Do we want to take a break now before the second part? Then it's more the hands on practical part. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the second part. Right, it's now the hands-on part, okay? Um, so now I'm putting my teacher educator hat on, okay, um, for this part. So this is what I propose for us to do. Um, we'll see how much we can, how much we get done, okay? So I was telling Maria Luisa, this is like a crash course on TBLT. So I'm trying to, 
um, show you kind of just the main components of it, right? Um, maybe at another time we can do a follow-up. I've done that with people who have gone back and then we do more um, and so forth. So anyway, but we'll see, right? Uh, or you might be like, oh, we don't want to <laughs> hear about TBLT anymore after this, okay. All right, so I'm going to start off first. We're going to go over what is and what is not a task. Okay, that's important because it gets confused a lot. Um, then I'm gonna, we're going to go over task-based methodology, and we're going to talk about a pre-task, during task, and post-task cycles. Then we're going to design a quick task-based lesson together. Okay? And then I'm going to leave you with some recommendations on how to adapt TBLT for heritage language learners. Okay? So let's start. Step one, when you're doing task-based language teaching, is you have to create the task. Okay? That's step one. Okay? So what is a task? So the original definition comes from Michael Long, right, in 1985. He basically said that a task is the 101 things people do in everyday life, at work, at play, and in between, okay? So I always tell my instructors, so when you think about tasks, it's everything we do in, a, in our daily lives, right? Um, in fact, sometimes I walk around, and I'm like, oh, that can be a cool task, right, <laughs> for a class, right? So it's everything that we do. Um, however, this definition, well, doesn't, it provides a general right, concept of what task is. What I do want to go over is basically um, kind of criteria for a task, OK? Um, and I'm using here two scholars in the field, um, Rod Ellis and Peter Skihan. Um, so first of all, what is a task? Number one, meaning is primary. That's very important, OK? The meaning is primary, and there is a proxy to the real world. Okay? It has to be something that the students will do similar, something similar in the real world, right? There's a communicative goal, or there's a problem to solve as part of the task. The learner must rely on his or own linguistic resources to complete the task. And finally, there's a non-linguistic outcome, all right? Students have to give us something tangible. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have to grade, right? <laughs> right? Um, so we need something tangible that we can use, OK, to kind of determine right, whether or not the learner has met the goals of the task. So we're going to stick to these four. There are a lot of definitions. By the way, um, the, the book chapter my colleague and I wrote for the volume that's coming out in Spanish, this will be all outlined in a chapter. right? We have put it all in one chapter. Um, with more um, sources for other people. A, a lot of people have defined tasks in different ways, but basically these are the four core principles. OK, meaning is primary, communicative goal, problem to solve, learner's own linguistic resources, and non-linguistic items. OK? First activity, I want everyone to look at A, OK? With your partner at your table, I'm going to give you about four or five minutes. I want you to look at these two activities, and with your partner, based on this definition, I want you to class determine which of these is the task, and which of which one is a non-task. Okay? Which one is undone? Yes. So which is you need to determine that. Okay? okay. Based on this definition, right? Okay. You're going to classify one of these as a task and one of these as a non-task. Okay? 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 And then and be ready to justify your answer. Okay, five minutes. Okay. All right. So let's see what um, survey. <laughs> um, so is the, the top activity the task or the bottom activity? How many of you said the top activity? Show of hands. Okay. So is it the top activity the task or the bottom? How many of you decided it was the top activity? Oh, smart, intelligent people in this room. <laughs> okay, excellent, right? Okay, so it is the top activity, the example of a task. Why? Okay, and let's contrast both, right? Okay, so let's look. Both of them, interesting, say, to write an email message, okay? If we think about Long's definition, mm -hmm. that is a task, because that's what we do in every day, right? Some of us for hours in a day, right? Okay. Um, but then when we get at the description, that's when things change a little bit, right? So let's look at the first criteria. Meaning is primary. What in the first one tells you that the meaning is primary? What indicates to us that meaning is primary in that first, the top one? Mm -hmm. That someone has to understand. 
that someone has to uh -huh, understand? What do they need to understand? That's right. So good. So here we have La Señora Celia Gomez, who has issued a complaint to the, to the company. Oh, I should probably say the name of the company, but a company. Um, and here you need to understand what that complaint is, right? Okay. In order to right respond to it. So that's meaning because you have to process right information. What else? Is there anything else about meaning? Mm -hmm. Exactamente. So we're giving the learners a purpose, right? Mm -hmm. There is a communicative goal, and it is to solve this problem, right? That Senora Gomez has raised, okay? Um, to the company, there's here, there's a problem to solve, okay? Um, does the learner use his or her own linguistic resources? Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. right? Okay, and what is the non linguistic outcome? the email, right, that they're going to share with their classmate in order to compare how they solved the problem, right? If we contrast that to number two, right, we see a different picture, right? First of all, what is the goal of the second activity that we're not calling a task? Now, I want to be very clear. Of course, I have very personal opinions about this type of activity, but I'm not judging this type of activity, we're not gonna get into that, right? That can be another discussion. What I wanna be clear is that this is not a task. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't do this in a classroom. I have very strong feelings about this type of activity, but eso por otro día, right? But this is not a task. That's all I want to say. Okay, why isn't it a task? First of all, what is the goal here? To practice the subjunctive in adverbial clauses. That's the goal, right? Yeah, I like your face. You're like, no, right? Okay. It, it, it approaches a task, but it's not yet. It's not getting there, yeah. It needs a lot of help. Yeah, exactly, right? Okay. So here the goal is immediately to practice the subjunctive in adverbial clauses, right? Which is the grammar topic of the chapter. What else? Um, is the learner using his or her own resources? First of all, is there a communicative goal? Let's look at that. Not really. Uh, a, week one. Huh? a week one. Yes, I like that. Okay, a week one, right? Because they have to describe a product that is damaged. Okay, but to whom we don't know, we, right? We we lack some information, right? Okay, so that's what I'm like. Eh, it's not so much. So this is weak. Okay, um, is the learner using his or her own linguistic resources? No, because what did we do at the end? Use quisiera. Use two adverbial clauses, dun, dun, dun. I mean, and I used to do this as a high school teacher. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, but what we're doing is now the learner is not using his or her own thing on linguistic resources. Careful. I'm not saying we don't teach grammar. We're going to see in the task-based methodology how that comes in. Okay. So I want to be very clear on that. Okay. I don't want to people going around the world. Oh, Julio said, don't forget about it. Um, grammar is important, but it's not. It shouldn't be part of the task description, right? And finally, is there a non-linguistic outcome? No, because the point is to practice the what? The subjunctive, okay? So is this clear how this is a task and the bottom one is not a task? Yes? I have a question. Yes. So mm -hmm. in, if in the first one we say something like to do so uh, without Um, no, no, okay. it's not a task. But what we're going to see is in the task-based methodology how that comes in. Okay. But it shouldn't be part of the task, right? Okay. Because remember how in the earlier session I said how task-based language teaching goes by psycholinguistic processes of second language acquisition? Because you teach something, it doesn't mean that they will produce it, right? Mm -hmm. So to do that, right, I think what's interesting is we let students use their interlanguage, what they have, in order to solve the task. Because sometimes you don't need these complex structures to solve a task, okay. right? You can use, you can solve it. So what I'm interested in my students is if they had this in the real world, can they do it, right? Yeah. How do it? However, it can be an opportunity for us to look at language, right? And how can they use language? But what I like about this, for me, is contextualized, right? It's not decontextualized as we saw in the video this morning. Well, there's still more. Oh, okay. Yeah, this morning. Okay. All right? Okay. One minute to go. Okay. Everyone's with me? Yeah? Any other questions? Yeah, let's talk about it. Sí, sí. 
porque se podían combinar las dos tareas. Porque si yo presento a mis estudiantes el primera, la primera situación, uh -huh. le digo, tienes ese problema, tienes que resolverlo. Y al final le digo, eh, make sure to, in, eh, to uh -huh. include uh -huh. the following communicative uh -huh. function, uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. what about that? Okay. No podríamos, vamos a hacerlo en otra fase, pero no es parte de la tarea. Yeah, pero yo presento una tarea y luego uh -huh. le digo que incluyan eso. Pero no, ahí entonces estás imponiendo... Eh, no, su propio... Exactamente. Eh, yeah. okay. Pero vamos a ver que en la pre-tarea, en yeah. la pre-task phase, uh -huh. we can go over structures we hope uh -huh. they will use. Uh -huh. But the problem is, if it's not in L2, right? And what we know is that if that structure... So, for example, let me give you an example that I've done. A task can be how to get from, um, I'm trying to use the local context. <laughs> the way, um, but if you want to get someone from one place to another on the campus, right? I do this, we do this in our, with our, as a task with our students at UC Irvine. We want them to get from the humanities building where they're taking Spanish to a pub on campus, right? Eh, fulanito llegó el otro día and doesn't know how to get there. Give him and her instructions of how to get to that place, right? That's a task. <coughs> What's, what grammatical structure we hope they're going to use? Imperatives. Imperatives, right? Commands, right? But if a student says the following, right? Doblar a la derecha, cruzar la calle, tan, tan, tan. Did that person solve the task? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The person's going to get to the pub, right? Right? OK. However, that person did not use commands, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe we taught the commands mm -hmm. because it might be in their interlanguage development that's not available for them. That's right. Now, we're going to talk about strategies in the post task. We can do the task and we can go back. And after they did the task, we're like, OK, how would we be able to give those directions, redo them using a command? Exactly. Ven la conexión? Bien, OK, yeah. Si se puede llegar, y estoy de acuerdo totalmente, al mismo sitio utilizando diferentes tipos de estructuras, construcción, sí, sí. Y supongo que habrá unas pretareas que les induzcan a. Sí. Vale, pero vamos a decir que no llega alguien a ese estadio de lingüística. Excelente. A la hora de evaluar esa tarea, when you say for, yeah, for no, the video, sorry. no, 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 keep on in Spanish, that's fine. When you say that the student did not get there, you mean they did not fulfill the task? Yeah, no, Let's no, say no. the student, the person they gave direction ends up in Washington, D.C., right? No, 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 Is no, that no, what you llega, mean? No, que no, no llega a, a, la, a, la, a los recursos lingüísticos que nosotros hemos ah, querido ah, 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 yes, 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 a lo largo yes, yes. de las mm -hmm. clases anteriores. Okay. A la hora de evaluar eso con un grade, yes, 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 yes. ¿cómo, se, ¿cómo lo evaluamos? Porque habrá, habrá mm -hmm. podido cumplir perfectamente mm -hmm. la tarea y me parecería injusto mm -hmm. que no mm -hmm. tuviera una buena nota como el que sí ha llegado a su estadio lingüístico que mm -hmm. nosotros pretendíamos, ¿no? Yeah. Pero ahí veo que hay como un mm -hmm. conflicto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a very good question, right? So how do we target structure, right? So in the task-based world, we were going to say that that doesn't matter, that what matters is the completion of that yeah. task, right? That's in an ideal world, because some of us yeah. have curriculum, right? <laughs> and we need to cover, right? So that's why in our program, for example, task, we do a task-supported approach, right? So that there are other types of things we're doing in the classroom, right? Um, and there are other types of <coughs> techniques uh, with grammar instruction, right? Um, that we do in order to see if they have, to, for them to display knowledge of the target structure. So in our task, we have a mix. We, have, we may have some type of task, a mini task that they have to do, which is evaluated differently from a part where we want them, we tell them, use the imperative in this to give, um, we use the series soliviento, right? Um, use um, commands to tell Jaime, to give instruction to Jaime to get to a certain location, right? So that, yeah, that, to ensure that they are using um, metalinguistic, right? That, that they, they can produce that target form, right? But again, when they're producing that target form, which is totally fine, it's explicit knowledge of that structure. It doesn't mean 
it's part of their interlanguage yeah. and part of their system. So when I tell my students my philosophy in our program is we're trying to do both, right? We want them to um, encourage this type of linguist, but we also want to give them opportunities to use their own linguistic resources to practice so that if I throw them in the middle of Mexico, they can survive, right? I had one of my worst students um, go to Spain. He was a senior, and he went to Spain as a senior trip, and he emailed me. Um, and he said, you're not going to believe what happened to us um, coming back to the airport in Barajas. Uh, my friend bought a sword in Toledo, a small sword, right? Of course, everyone buys a sword in Toledo. The security guard stopped us and opened it. He didn't speak English. And I was able to communicate. And I thought, I just <laughs> he was my, not my best student. Great kid, right? But he was a senior. He had senioritis. And you stop pensando, oh, he wanted to say the seguridad. But he was able to get out of the situation. I'm sure his grammar was not on target. But he was able to communicate in whatever Spanish he had, right, in order to get him out of the situation. That's what I want to hear, yeah. right, and so forth. OK. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. OK, good. OK, so now we're going to move on to the second part. Now we're going to see B1, B2, and B3. This one gets a little more interesting, OK? I want you to do the same thing. Which of these is a task? Which of these is not a task? Or are all of them tasks? Now we're going to a gray area, okay? B1, B2, 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 three, yeah, B1, B2, and B3. Okay, so let's, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but for sake of time. Okay, so let's kind of discuss, these were a little bit more, you had to think about them, right? A little bit more, right? Okay, so let's look at B1. How many of you classified it as a task? Tough group. Okay, good. All right, good. Why it's not a task? But in terms of the criteria, we go back to the criteria. There is not a connection with the real world. So there's no connection with the real world, okay? Paso uno gives you the choices. Paso uno gives you, right? Exactly what you're supposed to do. Okay. They give you the questions to use. So is the student using his or her own linguistic resources? No. Okay. Step two is asking you to come up with four more sentences of your own. That's okay, the that's a little, okay. So there's some glimpse of task there. Okay, okay, anything else? Okay, good. Now, again, does it mean that I would never do this type of activity with my students? Maybe this can be a warm up, this can be something. Again, I just want to make sure that we know it's not a task. But it, again, I don't want to be critical of this activity. There might be a pedagogical reason why you want to do this activity. It says it's not a task. Okay, let's look at B2. How many of you said this was a task? Excellent, very good. Okay, <laughs> this is a task, right? You're going to teach her about them. Okay, yeah, good, good. And I'm glad you guys said that because this is a task I designed for our 1A class, our first quarter of Spanish. Okay, so our, my, our graduate student instructors during the syllabus, there are days, they're supposed to do tasks as much as possible, mm -hmm. but I gave them days where they should only do a task-based lesson that day, right? So for the first one, I give them the task-based lesson. So I created this because they're getting trained on how to do task-based language teaching, so I provide them a model. So I give them the whole lesson for them to execute that day, okay? So this is the first task in our program because they have learned vocabulary about school supplies, numbers, and that sort of thing, okay? So we can see that this is a task, right? It has all these elements. Again, the non-linguistic outcome is the checklist, right? And notice also I gave you this example because this is a listening task, right? So tasks can have different skills, right? They can be writing, they can be speaking, but they also can be listening, especially at the beginning levels, we want them to get that input, right? And manipulate that input, right? And notice that the outcome is whether or not he or she has enough money, right, to produce that. The other thing I do with tasks, right, connecting it to the real world, especially with our students, is we need to put scenarios where they should see themselves using Spanish, right? Because this increases their motivation, right? There's a whole motivational theory um, called, um, oh, it's during 2009, cells, theory of motivation of cells, right? Um, in that when learners have a vision of themselves in the future using Spanish in these different situations, right? Um, those people tend to be more motivated 
to learn the language, okay? So how do we create this vision of themselves, right, where they see themselves using Spanish in authentic situations? We can manipulate that with tasks. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, because this is, okay. this is week, they do this week two of Spanish, first quarter of Spanish. They, these kids have had never, have never had Spanish before. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so with the task, what I tell my instructors, we go, right, because they're like, you're supposed to use Spanish, but I tell them, no, you can give this and they can read it, because it's too complicated to explain in Spanish, okay. right? So they finally read it, I preguntas, questions, and then, then they start the task. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is there any, because we kind of chat about the same thing, is there any point at which it comes into conflict, right? Because they're, the only target language, always target language, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. So at some point where it might conflict, I, I understand why you would do that, mm -hmm. because if you give, even in some higher levels, if you mm -hmm. give the instructions, you're right. just ask them these questions, you're giving them instructions about right. everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, no, so you're asking me a question, or you're kind of reaffirming my, well, I, I mean, my... I'm kind of asking a question, even in advanced levels, is there mm -hmm. talk about... No, I think you need to judge useful. that. I think, yeah, I think you oh, need to judge that for instructions and so forth. So, for example, in our tests, for example, reading comprehension, listening comprehension, they write their answers in English, okay. right? And I've gotten people say, why do you do that? Should it be... I'm testing comprehension. I'm not testing yeah. production. Isn't that the interpretive yeah. mode? That's right, and that's the interpretive mode. So how do I know if they're interpreting, if they're writing in Spanish, and now they probably cannot produce it in Spanish? And also, right, so when we have reading passages, a lot of the questions I see sometimes, students just can, oh, this word goes with that one, and they kind of can figure out, yeah. mm -hmm. right, which one, that's not testing comprehension, right? Because they just say, oh, that word goes with that. Does that, mean, does that really mean that they, right, no comprehension? So in our test, they write in English, right, after listening or after reading a text. All the, now, we have, for example, in the reading, we have a Spanish question, opinion, in which they write an opinion about the reading that they saw. That's in Spanish, and we don't grade their grammar. We only grade that they answer the question. If they answer the question and it's comprehensible, boom, they get the points. Because we also want to give them a chance to use Spanish without penalizing them constantly for not using grammar um, correctly, right? So yeah, so I have, that's my philosophy. Um, I taught at a place where people battled with me um, because of that, because they were, no, they should be producing all in Spanish. And we had different, obvious differences in opinion. Yeah, because, yeah. OK? All right, so we're good. What about B3? B3 is interesting, though. Yeah. How many of you said it was a task? I like this. I like, OK. OK, muy bien. Yeah, yeah. OK, so let's see. Is meaning primary here? Yes. What, is, what do they have to do? Some people have information, some people don't have information. They're exchanging new information, remember? We said that's communication. So they're doing that mm -hmm. here, right? They have to determine which, right? What one picture is missing, right? The other. Um, is it real world? No. 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 <laughs> they are not real world. <laughs> not real world, right? Okay. Not directly. Not, directly. not directly, okay. There's no contact. There's no context, mm -hmm. okay? So, ahí falla, right? There's mm -hmm. a little bit eh, right there. Um, are the learners using their own linguistic resources? Yes. 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 <laughs> Is there a non-linguistic outcome? <laughs> yes. So the only thing that's missing is that real-world component, mm -hmm. okay? And in the last, so there's every two years, we have a conference called the International Conference on Task-Based Language Teaching. The best conference ever. It's my favorite conference. Mm -hmm. I'm so energized out of that conference. Um, it's every two years if you're interested to go. Um, and one of the things we talked about, oh, I didn't talk about, my senior colleagues were talking about, is about operationalizing real world tasks, like how essential it is to the task, right? Um, so what I do when I see things like that, I try to give it a real world context. I like the real world context, right? Because I like students, right, understanding how they would use it. So what could be a real world context you can give this if this appeared in your textbook? Mm -hmm. I was just thinking if you ever had a class on Spanish for criminal justice students. Exactly. You could say one of you have like a place and then one of you have it after the crime occurred. That's right, exactly. And like what's different, what happened yes. in this room, and what do you think that means? That's right, for excellent, people. right? The FBI is coming to do an investigation and they want to, that type of thing. So you can kind of, well, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so yes, you can add, if you see this, you can add that real world component, but I would consider this a task. Okay, because it kind of meets most of the criteria. I just wanted to show you an example of something that can be eh, sometimes iffy, right? So that it's sometimes not as clear my example A, right? That there were clear one wasn't and one was. But again, what I tell my instructors, right? Um, and when I work with teachers on tasks, you cannot be creating these all the time. This is a lot of work, right? Yeah. But can you take the textbook that you have? and be inspired and convert things into tasks. Yes. And that's what sure. we do in our program. With my instructors, we open the textbook, we do a workshop, they look at an activity and they convert it into a task. Okay? Because, well, I mean, I don't have a life, but people who have lives, right? Okay? <laughs> There's a lot of research I have to do. But, you know, if you're a teacher, you want to have a life after work, right? You don't have time to be creating these constantly. It's a lot of work, right? So just take the textbook. Right? And I look at an activity and I'm like, can I make a task out of that somehow? Right? Yeah. And we're going to do that. That's what we're going to do in a, in a minute. I'm going to give you a reading passage. How can we convert that into a task? And the students can also make that connection. That's, That's right. Well, I don't like the book. I don't like this topic. But how do I make it possible? That's right. Well, and in our program, I want to make sure we are using the book because yeah. students pay a lot oh, of money. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's yeah. important. So my students are like, oh, everything you taught us, I'm going to throw the book away. I'm like, no, we can't do that. You have to use the book because the students are paying for it. Yeah. So they need to see. Um, kind of the that they're yeah. using the plan, and then you take it to the next yeah. level. Yeah. Yes. So you don't use a book with uh, that methodology. That's great. There isn't a there. So there are textbooks that have some of these, like information gap activities. There are these tasks in them, but there's not a book that is, that I know of. Maybe in English as a second language, because there's. No, there are a lot. And in Spain, there are no enfoque for tareas like yeah, many there, years yeah, ago. Yeah, I've used hint. Okay, there are some elements, so yeah, some yeah. textbooks I guess have them, yeah. and so forth. I, I'm not sure about oh, some of the tasks and some of these. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I, I don't want to say that because I don't want to promote. But I'll tell you after. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of don't want to give a commercial to because I'm being recorded. But I will tell you after. Yeah, no, 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 that's okay. I'll tell. I'll be happy to tell you after the the workshop. Okay. All right, we're good. Okay. So let's move on. Um, step one, create the task with those criteria, right? Are we good? <laughs> step two now, now we design the lesson around the task, right? Now we determine what pre-task and what post-task activities our students need to execute the task. We were talking about using planning tasks, right, to help them do that. So, um, so the first is the pre-task phase. And what does the pre-task phase mean? Um, is a way to prepare students to execute their task in a way to promote language development, okay? Because we cannot forget about language. So what are some activities that you can do before a task, right? One, you can give students a model of what you want them to do, okay? I'm a big proponent of that, right? Um, actually, um, at a conference a couple years ago, a symposium on Spanish as a heritage language, Guadalupe Valdez gave the idea um, of creating some type of database with models, right? That we need more models. I'm like, oh, that would be great if someone whoever has time to do that, right? Um, but that's such a great idea, right? So I look for models to give my students of what I want them to do, okay? I review pertinent vocabulary. Yeah. What, is, what is the type of vocabulary you're gonna need to complete the task? Notice how I'm doing all the language stuff before, right? Brainstorming ideas, okay? Conceptual maps. Focus on linguistic form. Let's go over a subjuntivo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see how we're not divorcing. We're not saying don't do explicit instruction, but see where it comes in, right? Task planning allows students to plan. So one thing we do in our program, especially for um, speaking type of tasks um, or activities, even if they're not tasks, is one of the things that gets that I worry about is when people are doing listening or speaking activities and students are reading. I'm like, that's not a speaking activity anymore. They're re that's a reading activity, right? So what we do in our program, we give them two minutes or three to write out what they would say, ideas. They close their notebooks and they interact, okay? So then it becomes, so that helps a lot. There's a whole literature on task planning and how task planning really helps learners execute the task a lot better, okay? Um, do a simpler version of the task. 
Okay? Maybe you can take the task and create a simpler version. So for example, in the task of my experiment, anyone remembers how many profiles they saw? Six. Remember the, oh, it's okay. Remember the, the um, oh, that was from the needs analysis, from the needs analysis. But remember when they saw the profiles who they were going to hire or lay off? Uh -huh. They saw six. A simpler version, if I were using that task in the classroom, a simpler version will be two. So they can practice. What do we do when we're doing that? We're helping them organize their cognitive resources, right? Right? To help them process the um, information that they have to make it, it, on which they have to base their decision on hiring or laying off. Okay? So these are some strategies that we can use um, in the pre-task phase. Um, then they do the task, okay? You can give, so you can even manipulate the task phase. You can give them a limit, um, a limited time, uh, a limit on time, I should say. You can add an element of surprise. While they're doing the task, add another element, okay? Perhaps your strong students are working together, you differentiating instruction, and you give them a surprise element to make their task more difficult. Y los pobrecitos que están luchando, right? you let them just do the task, right? You can differentiate instruction that way, okay? You can provide feedback as they're doing the task. So as they're doing the task, you're walking around in the class, you can provide recasts. Everyone knows what a recast is, right? Or some type of implicit, while they're doing the task, right? To help them execute the task, okay? So these are possible options, or you cannot do anything. You just let them be. That's an option as well, okay? So we have the pre-task, the task, and then what happens in the post-task phase are the activities you do after the task, okay? You can have them repeat the task. The same exact task, which I would find boring if I were a student, but maybe one that's very similar in format. There is a whole literature that's called task repetition. Okay? We see there's empirical evidence that when students repeat a task, their language complexity improves and their accuracy improves. Yes, by doing the task again. Okay? So a good idea might be, ya hicieron esta tarea, vamos a hacer esta, similar, and see how you do. So, okay? for example, they went, they did this exercise in Argentina, mm -hmm. in the context of Argentina, and then let's see a similar situation in Mexico, for example. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So now you have a similar situation in Mexico, but you're buying groceries. And this is clothing shopping, right? No, materials for school. Oh, materials for school. <laughs> okay, materials. materials for school, yeah. Um, so maybe the, the new list could be in La Ciudad de Mexico, you're buying groceries for dinner uh -huh. for that night. And she left you a voicemail message. Yeah. Or she left you a shopping list. Or something like that. Good. Excellent. All right? So yeah, because I wouldn't do the same one. I don't know, I would get bored if I had to do exactly the same. But there are studies that have done that. Actually, they've given the participants four times. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, the same time. Okay. Students can prepare a report. They can do a presentation of whatever results they find <clears throat> during the task. Focus on linguistic structures. So remember the task of the map? Cruzar, doblar. Okay, chicos, vamos a ver, doblar, cruzar. How would we make this? ¿Cómo cambiamos esto al imperativo que tantas veces les he dicho que use? Okay? You can do that, right? So then you do is, boom. They, okay, ¿cuál será el And you go over grammar again. But what's beautiful, what I love about this, is that it's done in context, right? That you gave them the context, the meaning for using the grammar. With our heritage writing courses, uh, one of the tasks, is it the heritage writing? One of our writing courses, I observed one of my instructors, um, the task was to write a love ad on uh, like a match or whatever, right? Online dating, right? They had to write a profile. They had to say what they were looking for in a partner. Um, the pre-task phase, they saw models in Spanish. Busco una persona que sea, no, da, 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 right? They wrote what my instructor did, which I loved, she, they wrote them in big pieces of paper and she had a gallery wall. Students were going around and correcting grammar and improving the accuracy 
of the ads after they did it. That was the post task activity. And it worked really well. Uh, I think this was a heritage class. Okay? And she went over grammar with them. Okay, chicos, se recuerden que el acento va aquí, tan, 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 during a post task phase. Okay? Reflections about language. So you can do it here. Review vocabulary. Correct errors. So seeing how in TBLT we're not saying forget about grammar. A lot of people always tell me that, no, that you guys don't focus on grammar. And okay, let's do an example of a task. Okay? Let's look at, so what I want you to, everyone see, you should look at C now. So imagine that you're teaching ESL, English as a Second Language, and this reading passage is in your textbook on social media. So what I want you to do real quickly is read it, and you don't have to write this, this idea that I have the actual task that we can do. What task would you develop based on this? Okay? 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 So a few minutes. Because of time, let's work on this as a group, and then there's another part, right? It's because I want to save time. Okay. Immediately, what ideas you would have of a task? Does anything come to mind? I know it's Saturday, so <laughs> I know we're stretching our brains. Okay. Um, any ideas that what type? If you looked at that, oh, I want to do a task with this reading somehow. What task can you do? And it doesn't have to be a reading task. It can be anything that that inspires you. Mm -hmm. It could be survey in the group, or okay. you know, which one of these social media you use more often. Yes. Mm -hmm. Time you spend, mm -hmm. text you send, emails you write, things like Okay, that. so a survey? Okay, good. What else? I would open a debate in class mm -hmm. and ask the kids if social media is good or bad for them. Okay, okay, so you would, okay, kind of getting a debate, like a type of task, okay, for them to look at the benefits yeah. or the, okay, this advantage of social media, uh-huh. Un blog, okay, okay, mm -hmm. okay, so you can create a blog, mm -hmm. right, maybe with their opinions about social media and so forth, they need to write a blog post, mm -hmm. okay, excellent, and you may even look for a blog that exists out there, right, I've done that with, with our, when I teach heritage writing, right, you have to write a blog post for this particular blog post, and how, you know, this is the issue, right? Um, yes? Depending on the complexity, you can make them have a rating of what they see the utility of each of them. Mm -hmm. like oh, okay, the excellent. That's right, okay, good. Okay, okay, uh-huh. Se puede eh, pedir varias tareas en una clase a different, por ejemplo, porque mm -hmm. a veces me ocurre decir simplemente, a ver, ¿qué tareas pensáis? Mm -hmm. Y uno dice, pues yo quiero, por ejemplo, eh, eh, trabajar en Wikipedia. Yo voy a abrir un, un blog por, o mm -hmm. voy a... Excelente, excelente, yeah. It can be different tasks for different people based sí. on their own motivation sí, eso, and it makes sí. it relevant. Exacto. Excellent, yes, exactamente, yeah, excellent. All right, so we're going to move on, yes, because of time, excellent. I usually don't have problems, teachers have so many good ideas, right? Uh, because we're constantly working in language. So, Maria Luisa and I did not coordinate this, but she gets the task that I came up with, which was a survey. But, uh, no, no, it's perfect. No, no, I just want to make sure that we were not, <laughs> we did not talk about this, yeah, and so forth. So the task that I came up with, um, and I, this is an activity I used in mind when I teach research, um, teaching methodology, right, for with my students, is this is the task, right? So remember, step one, create the task, all right? Our student newspaper, New School, wants to have a special issue on the use of social media among students. Okay? In pairs, your task is to create a Likert scale questionnaire with the goal to gather information. The questionnaire should be based on one of the aspects discussed in the reading passage, social media. That's the task. Okay? So it's creating a survey. Okay? I also want you to think, a lot of people when I talk about tasks, they think these big projects. No. It could be something that create a six question survey. That's a task. Okay, right? Okay, so it doesn't have to be a project, right? Because there's a whole literature on project-based learning. That's different, right? Okay, task can be something really small. Okay, based on this,
this task now, what I do want you to spend some time is D. What would be activities you would create during the pre-task phase? And task phase, we already have the task, unless you want to add something, and post-task phase. So real quickly, you have to jot down what are ideas based on this task, your students have to do this task, what activities you would do in the pre-task phase? Would you add something else in this phase? Maybe leave it like that, that's perfectly fine. And what activity you would do during the post-task phase? Okay, I'll give, I'll, this I want to give you a few minutes to look at. Uh, let's say social media, okay. yeah. So we can tell you it's survey, yeah, yeah, creative. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> think about it. No, but think about a survey, what type of things you might, yeah, yeah. All right, welcome back. Okay. All right, so what are some of pre-task activities you came up with in your groups? Pre-task activities. What would you do? Yes. So working on question formation. Question formation. Okay. Okay. How to form questions. Okay. What else? We were thinking about dividing maybe the text in two parts. Mm. And each part to different students maybe. And Ooh. Then okay. And ask questions too. So what was your part about? Ex excellent. Exactly. So dividing the text, having students report on the text, because remember that the task is connected to that reading, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to use the activity in the book somehow, right? Mm -hmm. So excellent, to help them digest the reading. Okay, very important, good. What else? Vocabulary. Vocabulary, mm -hmm. exactly. What type of vocabulary, um, either from the reading, um, do they need additional vocabulary, right, to create these surveys? On a map conceptual. See, excellent, right? A conceptual map of vocabulary, right, to get them to activate their linguistic resources, yeah. Model of questionnaires and what um, model, skills are. Oh, what are Liker skill? And I put that on purpose, right? Okay, yeah. What are if you put a Liker skill, do they know what a Liker skill mm -hmm. is? Can we show them a model of a Liker skill? Good. And you're gonna see some of my examples, and I have one mm -hmm. that I use. Okay, so I'm gonna give you examples of all these um, in a minute. Okay, what about post-test activities? I'm sorry I'm rushing us, but you know we uh, we want we're limited on time. Um, post-test activities. What about after the test? Apply the questionnaire yes. as a result, or, or before it goes out, revise it, but they have to choose what platform or social media they're going to use, the audience. Okay, good. Exactly. What type of audience that they can administer? Run it, or run it, or run Yes. One mm -hmm. What should be fixed before it really goes? Excellent. Out. So they can work with partners and look at the problems they have with language the that came up. Move in. Huh? Uh, pilot. Questionnaire first. Yes, pilot the questionnaire. That's what you said, pilot? Uh -huh. Yes, pilot the questionnaire first. Good, yeah. You talked about then going and asking your everyone asks their parents or a different generation or the Ask. CSL, people from their home countries. Good, administer the questionnaire to people, right? That can be a post test activity, right? Okay, excellent. So you guys touched upon some of my ideas. Good, we're on the same page. Okay, brilliant minds might think alike. Okay, so let's finish up. So these are some of the activities that came up with pre-task phase. Some of you already have mentioned them, so excellent, right? So one, review the reading. Without looking at the reading, name the types or example of social media that you remember from the reading. List them, right? As a warm-up, right? And actually model, I do this lesson with my students in my graduate course on methodology, right? So there are students in this ESL English class, right? Because I sort of want to teach them. How do you teach? How do you execute, right? Um, Concept map. What were the key aspects of the reading? Okay, that's important. Okay, again, because which was your idea of breaking up the reading as well, right? We want to make sure that they understood the reading, right, before they even can create the survey. Give them an example, a model. Hey, peeps, this is a Likert scale questionnaire. Okay. Look, what's, what target structure is identified immediately here? Remember, this is ESL, intermediate level, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, ING, I like, responding, commenting, viewing, playing, watching. Here's my target structure. 
Let's look at this term. What do you notice about the verbs? They all have ing. What do we say in the ing? Because we love that, right? As language teachers, obviously, okay? Show them a model of what the survey could look like. Okay, we got the task phase, bam. Post task phase, maybe. Again, you all have hinted to some of these. Switching surveys with a partner. Mm -hmm. Now with another partner, switch your surveys, and I want you, I want each pair to point out any comprehension, vocabulary, or grammar issues in the survey. Circle a maximum of five problematic items in your survey to discuss with the pair. Mm -hmm. Now again, language. Okay? As a class, let's discuss the issues that you all identified in these surveys. What were some of the issues that came up? Vocabulary, grammar, okay? Administer the survey, yay, right? Obviously, if you create a survey, you should administer, right? Administer the survey to five to 10 students in our school or community. And this happens in our campus. I've gotten approached by international students surveying me, right? Before this inspiration came from, okay? I've been surveyed like three times on campus, and I'm like, oh, oh but I'm a language teacher, I have to help them, right? No thing will be about that, right? But they do that, they can administer. With the heritage learners, it will be cool if they can administer the survey in their communities. That's right. Their parents, their neighbors, El de la Bodega, I don't know what you call it here. That's in New York. I grew up in New York, right? Okay? They can administer the survey in communities, depending on what the topic is. Okay? Bring back the survey, and let's talk about the results. What do you do with the results? Present your results to the class. Mm -hmm. This can be a follow-up activity next day. I've done this. Tally the total number of strongly agreed, disagree responses for each question. Create a pie graph. So when they come and present, they're presenting data, right? Like something simple, you don't have to go fancy, just a pie graph, mm -hmm. right? That summarizes the top four strongest agree or agree results of your survey. For each pie component, write the keywords of your survey. I like statement, I, I'm giving here specific instructions, right? You will present the results to the class. And what I've done is, okay, chicos, um, you know, chachos, blah, blah, blah. Um, let's see which of these was the biggest statement for everyone, or let's see what was the biggest issue for everybody. Do we share as a class the biggest issue, a big issue um, that everyone found in their service? Okay? Sí, se me ocurre, no sé si uh -huh. es buena idea o no. Es sí, sí. Un cuestionario escrito. Sí. ¿Qué te parece si como vos puede ser, por ejemplo, que transformen este cuestionario escrito en un oral? Exacto, claro. Uh -huh. Vale, ¿Vos? esto es lo que es. Vale, lo confirmó, vale. Vale, estamos de acuerdo. Ya, Siri está de acuerdo también, ya. Tenemos el sello de aprobación. No, no lo sacaste, no. Sello de aprobación, sí. Ok. Ya, yeah, you can play around with the modality. Excelente, ya. Yeah, that can be that as well. Ok, I have 10 minutes. Any quick questions? Because I'm going to end, how can we do this idea? These are ideas, again, of a chapter that's going to come on this volume of how to do this with heritage learners. In the real, in an ideal world, I would have loved to have more time to take these tasks and for us to edit them for heritage learners. But we cannot do that if you don't know how to create a task and task-based mental health. So I wanted to do that first. ¿Estamos? Okay. We're good? Okay, so let's finish up and then let's see. So, these are some of ideas for heritage language learners. Boom, number one, create a new ana needs analysis with the heritage language learners, especially if you're going to a new community. Gather information about their bilingual, local bilingual en environments, how they use the heritage language at home, what are their motivations and goals for studying the heritage language. It is not to put accents, most likely, or can be in some cases, right? Um, or maybe like the video, I'm thinking about the translation, okay? But also, it can be other things as well. So we need to gather that information. And we, we see from studies or surveys, right, that some students do want to improve their grammar, right? They want to learn um, grammar. They want to improve um, their language. But kind of getting also at the communicative needs, right? How do they use the language in their local community? We need to learn about their local community, right? Okay. Um, Assess whether the tasks you use are relevant and valuable. We saw that from the study I showed you, right? Again, steal my task specific questionnaire from our study, right? That's not ours, by the way, it was from someone else, in, right? Um, 
and adjust tasks accordingly. So I haven't taught that business Spanish class again because I moved from university, so where I am now, I don't do that. My colleague at George Mason, she told me that she has revised the tasks, right? So you, we know as teachers, right, we continue tweaking things, right? So again, based, because remember the task two, I told you there was eh, a little issue, so she has, right, um, edited the task. Because this gives us information about the value and how relevant those tasks were, the tasks were to their learning. Uh, next, keep in mind, Okay, and these are strategies that I didn't come up with. These are ideas that go around in our field in heritage language pedagogy. Keep in mind that heritage learners use different variations of the heritage language at home. Design tasks that validate their local varieties and registers. And in fact, I was thinking, if you design a course based on using tasks for heritage learners and it's the first time, you may want to start with those tasks first to build confidence, right? To build their motivation. Okay, so for example, create an ad for a local business that will air in a local radio station. Right? La Mega, I don't know what a, a other, right, the famous one, right? Like, you're going to create an ad, and notice that this is, what type of task is this? Oral production, because that's what they're strongest, right? Heritage learners, right? And use the Spanish that you would use in your community to promote that. I'm working with a teacher in Chicago right now who's doing a task-based research with her students, and she has a lot of receptive heritage learners. These are kids right, who can understand but cannot produce in her Spanish one class. So we're looking at task-based interventions with them, okay? And the first, the major task that they're doing, that she's doing, she's collecting this data as part of also her action research project, but we're hoping to continue developing it, um, is that they need to create a, uh, an ad in the local bilingual newspaper, she lives in Chicago, okay, to promote school supplies, okay? But because it's a local bilingual, they're going to do it in a way that it will be reflecting of their dialects and their local variation. Okay? So again, we want to make sure in our classes, right, we're also validating their Spanish, right? That there isn't anything wrong with the Spanish that they're using in their local environment. Okay? Our expert here on multiliteracy approach, right? There's a lot of work on that, right? Consider also multilingual and multimodal lens to these tasks. Right, so the work that Maria Luisa does, I like, right? So maybe kind of creating different tasks with different modalities as well, okay? Can be also incorporated, okay? Grammar explanation. So this is something I thought about. So remember, heritage learners have such a, right, they're a lot of variability in their grammars, in their knowledge. Even when you have a placement test, right, there are discrete pieces of knowledge that they have, right? So I think perhaps, and I'm not, I might change my mind after a couple years or something, right? Perhaps explicit instruction is more appropriate during the post-task phase. Why? Because you don't know what each learner, they're so varied, right? It probably makes more sense, and that's what we do in our program, like I see my instructors doing, they do the grammar after, they see what comes up after the task, and then they target those structures, right? Okay? Um, However, notice that I say here we need empirical evidence for this, right? Um, and in fact, my next one of my next studies will be looking at that. I'm gonna kind of I was talking to the group yesterday, manipulating instruction, manipulating the timing of instruction. Do I give it before the task, after the task? And the group will not have any explicit instruction and see what are the effects, right? So do they benefit more? What the data with the L2 learners suggests is that it's better to give the grammar explanation after the task. Okay? Porque se enredan before the task. Okay? And in fact, the study that I showed you with my HLL2 learners, remember I told you they came from an advanced grammar class? Two, this happened twice. I'm not saying that this is now, right, what's going on, but what I found interesting when I was listening to the recordings, a heritage heritage pair, one of the, their LREs was about the subjunctive. Creo que aquí se usa el subjuntivo. Sí? ¿Por qué? ¿Cuál es la regla? No me acuerdo. Ta, 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 ta. And they didn't, they never got it. Both two different pairs, right? As they were doing the task. So I was like, that's interesting. Los pobres se están enredando with the, trying to figure out the rule as they're trying to solve the task. So it may be more beneficial, I say this cautiously, right? That perhaps the grammar instruction should go after they've done the task, and then probably then you do a repeat, right? Task repetition, right? 
to kind of get them hopefully to use the structure. Again, if you see me in three years, five years, for the mundo saying something else, <laughs> right? They'll say, oh, we're gonna speak eso, right? Because maybe the empirical evidence show otherwise. But I found that to be, that's what inspired this study. Mm -hmm. Because when I heard that, I was like, oh, esto es interesante. Están enredados. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because they were in a grammar class. These kids came out of a grammar class that they were taking. Mm -hmm. what, is it ever okay or appropriate uh -huh. to frame grammar in the following way? Mm -hmm. Hoy, antes, ayer, mm -hmm. mañana, mañana si Dios quiere, mm -hmm. as opposed to present, Frederick. I like that. I like that better. Conditional, mm -hmm. which yeah. means nothing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no. I think that's that's a, be a much better way of framing it. I agree. Yeah. Um, I noted that I haven't talked about. Right. That that would be another workshop. Right. Like looking specifically at grammar instruction and how we teach grammar. Right. Um, um, but yeah, I think doing the grammar that way, especially for heritage learners, is a lot more doable. I think it's more. Um, approachable than giving them the, the names, right? So we have a, right, some people teach them the names. I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily, right? So we have grammar boot camp at the end of our writing course, right? So in our writing class, for example, we don't really, we focus on their mis right, errors and their writings, but we don't really explain grammar until the end of the course because it's based on the issues that emerge from that class. So we don't do grammar explanation a priori, mm -hmm. right? is post, and then we call it grammar boot camp. And they like it, right, because they want to, right? So like, okay, these are the issues, let's target them, okay? But notice that, again, to me, I think it's more relevant, because they have produced meaning, they have produced content, and now they're seeing how the grammar helps them to communicate those ideas. And I don't think only with heritage learners, I, we do this with our L2 learners as well. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Sure. Would it, so I'm thinking that this would be a great place to maybe even ask, the heritage learner to come up with, because you retain 90% of what you teach someone else. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that there is a way to teach accents that involves dance, like okay. bachata y las palabras. Oh, I like that. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Ideas yeah. Are yeah. No, good. Thank I'm you. glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. So I think maybe it may be more advisable at this point. Um, and I was hesitant about writing this in the chapter um, because it's gonna <laughs> be in print. Um, but again, it may be, and I, but I do, I caution, but again, my next study is looking at that, at the timing of instruction around the task, okay? Um, Maria Carrera is our great expert, great Maria Carrera on differentiated instruction when you have mixed classes, right? Can we differentiate the task, the same task, or think about differentiating the pre-task and the post-task activities. I'll give you an example real quickly. Remember the first task about La Señora Gomez who had the complaint mm -hmm. and they have to send an email? I was thinking maybe we can differentiate the planning task. For example, a planning task can be sending a memo to the company CEO with ideas to solve the problem. This is what? Brainstorming. Mm -hmm. But look how I would differentiate. Heritage language learners need to send a voice memo L2 learners a written memo. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because they are going to be brainstorming, the heritage learners may have an easier time brainstorming orally, so they can send. And I know uh, teachers, when I work with teachers in Guanajuato, they use all this technology. There's a lot of voice type of um, web 2.0 kind of type of things, right, that people can do that. So maybe for brainstorming, the her let the heritage learners brainstorm in an oral mode, the L2 learners in a written mode, as planning, mm -hmm. and so forth. Because what they're trying to do is trying to get their ideas right, um, going. So this can be an example of how you can differentiate right, a pre-task activity. Okay. Finally, remember that heritage learners are not homogeneous. Right? We know this. right? Their identities are at the intersection with other identities and subgroups. So can we design tasks that reflect that intersectionality and their complex identities as well? Okay? Again, the way we set up these scenarios and these contexts of tasks, right, really should be um, done in a way that really motivates them to engage with the language. Because that's what we want to do, right? 
our biggest, when teachers tell me, how do you motivate them? So we don't have control over their motivation, right? When they come into our class, so we don't know what experiences they have with the language, right? Um, uh, maybe I brought una cura, un año, where you can inject them with some motivation, right? <laughs> and boost their motivation level. The only thing we have control as teachers is the pedagogical materials that we create. And that hopefully, these pedagogical materials will be motivating and relevant to help them increase their motivation to learn the language. And these are two resources. That's the task-based language teaching resource. My colleague, my wonderful colleague at Indiana University has started this site. Um, I have included tasks that my students have created. There are articles, okay? Um, it's just beginning, so we're gonna continue hopefully adding to this so you can see more information, resources on using TBLT in the classroom. Thank you. <laughs>